Right. To um, start a new section, a lot of folks don't know a whole lot about the covenants, so we spent some time on the covenants so you guys could at least get some information on them. Um, probably the next most neglected part of the Old Testament is the Minor Prophets. And, you know, it's, uh, uh, they're, they're often overlooked, and um, they're the books from Hosea through Malachi. That's where people usually stick Hezekiah. Okay. Uh, huh? Yep, in the, in the uh, Minor Prophets there. But um, they're called Minor not because they're less important than the rest of the prophets. They're called Minor generally because of the shorter nature of the books. Zechariah is probably the longest. Um, some of them, like Obadiah, are just one chapter. And so we're going to walk through some of these. The reason I wanted to go there is because some of them, they're very obvious. The prophetical connection between the Davidic covenant and the new covenant that we, and even the Abrahamic covenant, we see them very clearly spelled out in the minor prophets for the nation of Israel and Judah. Um, in fact, even tonight as we look in Hosea, we'll see clear references back to the covenants. And so what hopefully this will do is, um, with some kind of point of reference about the covenants now, as you read through the prophets, it'll make a little more sense to you when you read certain things and see how it kind of all fits together under what God has promised to do um, with, with the land of Israel. Um, so just a little bit about this. Um, it deals, um, in the minor prophets, we find some great truths about how God deals with his people how he deals with other nations, um, not just in the minor prophets, but in a, a lot of material in all of prophecy deals with specific prophecies for nations outside of Israel and how God is going to deal with them. Um, we see some messianic prophecies, and of course there's the end time prophecy. The messianic and end time prophecy, if you were to put prophecy statistically in the books of, pro of the prophets probably would rank three and four out of four. Um, God's call to the nation of Israel to turn from their sin would be the number one call. The, uh, the call to uh, have a right heart for God would be the number two call. Then the messianic prophecies would come in there and then the actual end time prophecies. So um, a lot of the minor prophets as well as the major prophets is not a guy walking around telling the future. You know, we think about Old Testament prophets. We think about people talking about, and in the latter days it shall be so-and-so, right? Um, that A lot of that is there, but that's not the bulk of it. Um, so just some things about prophecy since we're looking at it tonight. Um, give you a definition. The prophet is the, uh, yes, the, prophet is the spokesman for God. Okay, he comes on the authority of God. A lot of the prophets will start out their books uh, with the word, the burden of the Lord, or the message from the Lord. Their messages a lot of times are um, prefaced by the phrase, thus saith the Lord. So they're coming with the authority of God to bring a message, and the message um, is generally a message of, uh, if you guys don't get right, God's going to hammer you. Okay, that was a lot of the messages to, of the Old Testament prophets. Again, not just to Judah and Israel, but also to, to Babylon, to Assyria, uh, to Tyre, to Sidon, to a lot of other nations, Moab and Edom, Edom you find in prophecy. And so the prophet was a spokesman for God. He was a, a one who declared truth. And that truth could com contain a message of um, turn from your sin get your act together, or a message of truth concerning something that would happen in the future. And um, so it's interesting there. In prophecy, we learn about God. Some themes, let me give you some themes of prophecy. Um, in order of importance, or not in order of importance, but in order of the most mentions, okay? Will that make it clear? The things that are mentioned most. The number one theme we find in prophecy is repent. That message, that theme is found more often than any other theme in prophecy. Um, number two is the theme of God will judge sin. So repent and God will judge sin. So if, if the idea of turn from your sin doesn't get your attention, 
then the idea if you don't turn from your sin, God's going to judge you, hopefully would get your attention. It didn't for Judah and Israel. I don't know how it worked out for us. Uh, number three, the third most mentioned concept is the coming Messiah. And then number four would be the Messianic kingdom. Or let's, let's call it this, number four would be the day of the Lord. Okay? Um, when I say the day of the Lord, I hope everyone knows what that means. I'm not going to assume you do, so we'll explain it. Um, we'll find the term in prophecy. You'll find the term in prophecy, the day, the day of the Lord, in that day. All of those refer to not a day, but to a time period. And that time period um, covers, depending on who you read and who you debate and all those kind of things, I'm going to say it covers the time from, it begins at the rapture and continues to the end of the millennium. Okay, some people would say it only covers the tribulation and not the millennium. Some people would say it only deals with the millennium. Some would say it begins at the ascension. But basically, in prophecy, we find the day of the Lord dealing with the tribulation events and the millennial kingdom. Okay, And I think if you keep it limited to the tribulation events and the millennial kingdom, then you're staying within the bounds of Scripture. And you don't have to worry about trying to defend that position because if you're in the bounds of Scripture, it's the right position. right? Um, so that would be the day of the Lord. And we find it all through Scripture. Okay? or especially all through prophecy, and we'll look at some of those as we go. So that would be the fourth one. Um, and sometimes in the day of the Lord, you, you could actually break that section down because some passages deal strictly with the millennium. Some deal, like in Joel, there, there's some pretty good sections about the tribulation. Um, Isaiah is a major prophet. We're not going to look at Isaiah, but Isaiah's got some of both. Okay? Um, by the way, again, if you have any questions when I'm going along, raise your hand, ask me, or look at me like I'm crazy and ask me. But if you don't, I'll just keep going right on. Okay, so we good? All right. Um, so, so in, in prophecy, we also, I've mentioned it a number of times throughout this course, that when we want to study theology, the Old Testament is really the place to do that. The Old Testament is where we really go to learn about the character of God, the nature of God. Um, probably more clearly, the New Testament focuses on the Son, um, and we do see some about God from the New Testament. But when you read theology books, you're going to find that probably 90% of the quotations having to do with the attributes of God come from the Old Testament. And so when we look at prophecy, we learn some things about God. Um, we see more of his personality. We find that God is alive. God is working and God is holy. Even though one of the prophets, one of the minor prophets, basically has a theme asking the question, where are you, God? Uh, and by the end of the book, he's like, okay, God's working, God's in control, God's got a plan. Um, and so we see that idea of the personality of God, that he is in control, he's alive, he's working, he hasn't forgotten, even though things look ugly. Uh, number two, we see <coughs> some of his purposes, and the ultimate purpose we find is that God expects his creation to glorify him. Okay, God is not neutral in this aspect. Prophets um, will constantly bring out the fact that God is working to bring glory to his name, and God expects his creation to glorify him. And then the third thing we'll see is God's power that God is able to accomplish his purposes by either miraculously changing things or intervening in history or moving certain pieces on the board of the world to accomplish what he wants to get accomplished. And so um, even today, we know there are future prophecies that haven't been fulfilled. God is at work today putting all the pieces on the chessboard to bring all these things to pass. So uh, that's just a, a, a quick overview let me give you some dates to kind of give you a, an understanding of, of prophecy. These are B.C. centuries, okay? I'm just going to give you some, some numbers and some names so you can kind of see. One of the things I want you to see is we tend to think, when, when you look at the major prophets and minor prophets, what is a, 
something that we could very easily think. The major prophets came first. Yeah, all the major prophets came first and the minor prophets came. That's not how it worked, okay? Some of them were actually ministering at the same time. Some were ministering together in the same kingdom. Some were ministering at the same time, but one would be in Israel, one would be in Judah, and they didn't have any overlap. Uh, so let me give you some, some dates and some names so you can have these, and it may help you. Um, when you're reading the Old Testament, especially you're reading in, let's say, 1 Kings chapter 17, and there are events going on there. Um, you can read about those same events in Chronicles. You can also go um, out to Isaiah. Isaiah deals with some of the events recorded in Kings and Chronicles. And so if you understand when all these people were ministering and what was going on, it kind of helps you put the puzzles together. Um, the other thing that would help you would be a, have you guys ever seen the chronological Bible? Um, those are really good historical helps because that Bible is written and it'll take, let's say, the event where um, Sennacherib comes and attacks Jerusalem. Well, there are passages recorded about that in Kings, Chronicles, and Isaiah. And so you would get it all in one, one paragraph. So you could read the whole thing. It's really a neat study tool. But anyway, dates. The 9th century B.C. We have the following prophets. We have Obadiah and Joel. In the 8th century, and if you need me to repeat these, let me know. Obadiah and Joel in the 9th century. In the 8th century, we have Isaiah, Hosea, Amos, Jonah, and Micah. Sounds like Skip's family. <laughs> yes. 8th century, we have Isaiah, Hosea, Amos, Jonah, and Micah. Don't tell Skip I said. No, you can tell him. Everybody good on that? All right. Seventh century. We have Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah. Again. Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah. Spelling counts. No, just kidding. Do you need them repeated, Debbie? Yeah, Which, all right. Seventh century, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah. And you got that outline I gave you. You could find their names and maybe just write the number by their name instead of trying to spell their names. Everybody good on those? All right, now when we come to the 6th century, we're going to break it down because what happened at the end of Jeremiah? Let's see, test your knowledge of Old Testament history. If you don't get this right, you all fail the course. Jeremiah died? <laughs> <laughs> no. Babylon kicked in. Babylon kicked in. All right, the nation of Judah is taken into captivity. And again, if you've got that, uh, that chronological Bible, you can read the events of when it happened back in Kings and Chronicles and the prophecies of Jeremiah because Jeremiah was an eyewitness to the events um, and he recorded them. So we have the 6th century is broken down into the exile prophets and the post-exile prophets. So the prophets that prophesied in exile... Give me one of them. One of them should be obvious. Yeah. Daniel. Daniel. Okay, Daniel. And the other was Ezekiel. So Ezekiel and Daniel were the prophets when the nation were, was in exile. And then the prophets that prophesied after the exile were Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And those were, I'm sorry, Haggai and Zechariah, those were 6th century post-exilic prophets. So in the 6th century, you got Ezekiel and Daniel in exile. You got Haggai and Zechariah post-exile. And then Malachi was a 5th century prophet, post-exile. 
Malachi, fifth century. So even if even if you got nothing else out of tonight than understanding, if you're reading Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, you're dealing with people who have been out of the land for at least 70 years. Now they've returned to Israel. They're rebuilding the temple. They're rebuilding the wall. The nation's getting reestablished. But by the time you get into Malachi, I guess what's already happening? They're already re- reverting back to exactly what got the nation taken into captivity. So, yeah, shocking. Um, so any questions, anything we need repeated on all that? That's just some foundational things that hopefully will help you as you read the prophets and uh, you can put things together. I think one of the reasons a lot of people don't study the Old Testament is because it seems so fragmented to them because they don't, they've never backed off and just gotten kind of a, an overview and they don't know how to put it together and where to put pieces together so that it makes sense to them. Um, so hopefully this will be a help to you. Uh, so we'll go ahead and we're just going to jump into a book. Question? That the third, the, the basic like promise message from God, the themes after the themes, you went through three something I missed, whatever. Um, what, we, what we learn about God in prophecy, um, his personality, his purpose, and his power. Yes, Cece. Um, I know at least 80 numbers are um, like the 20th century, it's 1900s, whatever, backwards on the BCs. So, what are the 9th century, what dates are we looking at? Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, the 800s? Yeah, I think it's the 800 okay, BC so time frame. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, this century be 400 all the way yeah. down to. And really, Malachi was the last word from God prophetically until John the Baptist. Um, so after Malachi begins what we call the intertestamental period in the history of Israel. So, the silent years. So, good. Good question. Anything else? All right. Let's look at Hosea. Hosea is the first of the minor prophets. And uh, I'm just going to read a little bit about Hosea. On your outline, um, I have just an overview of the book for you. So we'll look at that, and then we'll kind of dive in and look at some things actually in the book. Um, one of the, the, the major theme of the book is God's persevering love. And how many here have read the book of Hosea? Okay. Um, just a quick overview. God tells Hosea to go marry somebody named Gomer. Okay, now, I would, huh? Yeah, that that would be problematic, number one. Uh, We're going to have to just change that name, honey. Gomer's just not going to fly. But what's the problem with Gomer, other than her name? She what? She's a prostitute, okay? Um, Some of the things that God does with the prophets are done to illustrate a truth. Ever read Ezekiel? You guys have... Hmm? Well, you know, he builds... A, he, he makes a roll out of paper, then God has him eat it, and he, like, builds a sandcastle, and then God has him destroy it, and um, he has him walk around unclothed for a while, proclaiming messages. So when God spoke through the prophets and dealt with the prophets. He would have them do things sometimes that were symbolic. And the idea of Hosea marrying Gomer was so repulsive to the people in that day. You just didn't do that. And so by the end of the book, God is comparing his love for Israel to Hosea's love for Gomer because after she does all she does, he takes her back. And as repulsive as that was in society, God is basically telling Israel, you guys are worse than Gomer ever thought about being, and yet I love you. Um, And so that goes into that theme of God's persevering love. The wickedness, the rejection, the disobedience, none of those things ever 
stop God from loving the nation of Israel. Now, it didn't stop God from chastening the nation. And, and this is, when we go to the Old Testament, hopefully you guys have heard enough and you're learning, draw the, the timeless truths out of the Old Testament. Okay, don't go there and think we've got to live like them because then you're going to be teaching law and you're going to be so confused you don't know which way is up. But when we look at these Old Testament prophets, we can see that, that God is loving his people even when it seems like his people are going through some difficult times. And so what I want to do is just look at some of the, the passages in the book of Hosea <clears throat> and see if you guys can pick out which covenant God is honoring <clears throat> or is promising to honor because of what he's doing. So let's look at, uh, <clears throat> let's just read some here. Hosea chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beri in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, notice... And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. So the, in, the indication here is that even though the nations were divided, Hosea is traveling into both because some of the prophets only mention one kingdom or the other. And so he was active in Israel. He was active in Judah. And basically the message to both of them is the same. You're headed the same way and you're going to face the same thing. But he says, <clears throat> verse 2, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, and again, there's that authority, the word of the Lord. We'll see that, that type phrase repeated. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and a ch of children of the whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibliam, which conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel. For yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause uh, to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. There's a little prophecy in here about Jehu. Who knows who Jehu is? Was. Yes, he was a king. Uh, but he was a. Uh, he, yeah, he was a very wild driver, but. Jehu killed everybody. I mean, like, if you were breathing, Jehu would come kill you. Um, and because of his tendency to <clears throat> just murder, God prophesied in the books of the kings that, that he would pay for it. And so this is the promise here that the house of Jehu is going to be judged. Um, and so it says, notice what he says. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So one of the children was um, Jezreel. And we've got what the name means. The name Jezreel means God will scatter. Okay. Um, the Jezreel Valley. What's another name for that? Armageddon. Armageddon. Okay. It's a massive valley. When we were there, we were up on the actual uh, mound at Armageddon. And the... Uh, the IDF Air Force and their F-15s were coming over and going down and, and like flying treetop through the valley. It was a cool thing to see. Um, I guess they were doing practice runs for what we know has happened, but uh, they were in the air. They were, man, they were turning and burning. It was pretty fun. You could hear them. Sometimes they were going so fast you could hear them and not see them. But anyway, the valley's massive. That's where the Battle of Armageddon is going to be. You, I mean, you can't hardly see the end of it. It's just a massive place and it's a place of judgment. Um, but the idea is that God will scatter, and it's a direct prophecy that God is going to ultimately destroy the northern kingdom. Then there's another child, it says in verse 6, and again she conceived, uh, and God said unto him, Call her name Lo Roma, for I will have no more mercy upon the house of Israel, but shall utterly take them away. That name literally means a never, someone who never knew their father. And it's the idea that because of disobedience and idolatry, God is going to judge. And then there's another child. Uh, oh, no, let's see. Look at verse 7. He says, But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them uh, by the Lord their God and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, nor by horse, nor by horse, horses, nor by horsemen. All right, here's another test of your Bible knowledge. I'm pointing these out so that when you're reading prophecy, you understand what's going on. What is he referring to here? When God saved the house of Judah and there wasn't a shot fired. Yeah. 
That was before the kingdom. Hmm? Yes. Who was the king then? Remember I told you people usually put this book in the... Uh, Hezekiah is referring to that. Notice the king of Judah. He's going to save the house of Judah. So when you're reading these minor prophets, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with how Old Testament history works and what's going on, verses like this aren't going to mean a whole lot to you unless you take some time and you do some digging. Or you're familiar with your Old Testament history, right? Right? <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, so there's a promise that while Israel was going to be destroyed, Judah at one point was going to be saved. Now, we know Judah was ultimately going to captivity, but not at this point. And then verse 8, Now when she had weaned lo Ruma, she conceived and bare a son. Then God said, Call his name lo am I. For ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. So this, again, is the idea that uh, God is making it clear that Israel is going to be judged. But notice verse number 10. This could be a cool test question. Verse number 10, tell me specifically what covenant. Abraham. All right. Yet the number, now he's already said I'm going to judge you. You're not my people. I'm not going to be your God yet. The number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Again, what covenant would cover that? Abraham. Abrahamic. So if you understand that Abrahamic covenant we looked at, the promises that God made to Abraham, even though he is going to judge the nation and take them out of the land, here is a reaffirmation and a re-promise. I don't think re-promise is right. Reaffirmation is probably the best word. That he is going to be faithful to that covenant that he made with Abraham. Again, the necessity of understanding those covenants when we study prophecy especially, because we'll see over and over these type of statements all throughout prophecy. Now when you guys read prophecy, you know, right? Thank you, Andrew. Andrew's nodding his head, yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Has, has uh, covenant not been built? No, it is still yet to be fulfilled. Israel has never held the land promised. Uh, I guess I was just thinking about the, the big nation part of it. Um, the which part? The, the big nation part of it, like the sand of the sea. Yeah. The multitude. Um, yeah, it's it's still an unfulfilled covenant. It won't be fulfilled until the millennial kingdom. Um, Notice in verse number 11, this idea continues. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. So very clearly there we see the Abrahamic covenant. Um, look over at chapter 3. Um, let's see. Chapter 3, look at verse number Four. It says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, ephod and without a teraphim. And af or afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. What covenant would we say this one would refer to? The Davidic covenant. Okay, they're, the prophecy is that they're going to go for a long time without a king. That's happened, right? Since Judah went into captivity to Babylon, Israel has not had a king on the throne of David, of the Davidic line. The afterword he's referring to here, and then notice the latter days, we're looking. Here's a question. The term latter days, I mentioned it a couple weeks ago in a Sunday morning message. If you get my notes, you should know this. The latter days when we're speaking prophetically, specifically, what do the latter days mean according to the Jewish uh, Old Testament scholars? Maddie's looking the answer up. Hmm? That's close. Another way of saying that the day of the Lord. No, it's they broke it down. Um, 
kind of as a subset referring specifically to after the birth of Christ, but not yet in the millennium. So the latter days is referring to the time period we're in actually now. Um, so that's what it's... money, so that's my excuse. For yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Uh, and so this is a clear point that some point after the birth, life, and death of Messiah, these events will start happening so that they'll have their king on the throne again. I don't remember if it was in the introduction one, Maddie, or in the uh, the one from the week before last. So she doesn't know. Yeah, she's got all that information and just all right. Um, so um, let's look at the key verse in the book of Hosea. Look over at chapter fourteen. Carolyn wants the powerpoints. Uh, you just need to send me your email. <laughs> Part one? What did it say? What did my notes say? Um, not just end times, but specifically the time after Messiah's birth, and then it follows this present age. Okay, so basically the time frame we're living in is that phrase, latter days. It is different than in that day, or the day of the Lord, or the day. So the Hebrew scholars, I don't know, I necessarily agree with them in splitting that hair, but it was just an interesting note that the Hebrew scholars who studied the Old Testament separated latter days out from day of the Lord. So I thought I'd point that out to you. I'd make another good test question, wouldn't it? So that was their way of calling them out church age. Pretty much, I mean, we would call it the church age or this present age, but I don't know that they recognize the church so much as they recognize that there would be a time after Messiah was born that events would happen preceding the day of the Lord. No, they didn't know it was going to be yeah. a church age. That's what it was. Yeah, that's what it, yeah, exactly. I guess what's odd is why I thought it was after that, like not now, was that it's talking about Israel returning, seeking God. They're not doing any of that now. Like that's not until, yeah, after all the stuff has happened. Yeah, and, and again, this is something the Hebrew scholars have done. I don't know that I would split that hair. I think I would tend to put latter days in with day of the Lord. Um, so, so you're saying is I'm right. No, I'm just saying, I would never say that. Even if you were right, I would never say that. You know better than that. That's what I heard. Um, so they're saying the day, of the, uh, the day of Christ's birth is... Mm-hmm. Well, they don't recognize Christ's birth. The, the, uh, those in Judaism and the Hebrew scholars of the day of the Old Testament, they don't recognize Jesus. What do they use for the latter day of separation? Well, it's just something they... It's an arbitrary date, an arbitrary time that they... Well, it's not specific. No, it's not specific. Um, so that definition isn't a biblical definition. It's just from the Hebrew scholars. So um, so let's look over the key verse. And this, again, reflects the, uh, this idea. It reflects the theme of God's persevering love. The key verse of the book is um, chapter 14, verse 4. He says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. That's an incredible statement. What will we call that today? Grace. grace. People are like, oh, all you people only see grace in New Testament. There's grace all over the Bible, if you understand what grace is and know where to look for it. Uh, that is a statement of grace. For I will heal them. I will, love, I will love them freely. For mine anger is turned away from him. Um, and then the, the promises, Israel will be, at, uh, I will be as due unto Israel. He shall grow and, as a lily and cast forth his roots in Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree and the smell as of Lebanon. Um, and he goes on and makes promises to a blessing to the nations, uh, to the nation of Israel. Um, again, this one would probably fall more under the Abrahamic covenant of blessing um, because uh, God told Israel, or Abraham that you'll be blessed, and then he said there were other ways you'd be blessed, but there's just that one word blessed in there, and this could possibly be that ultimate blessing. So um, so there's just a little taste of the book of Hosea. Okay, If you've never read it, never studied it, uh, hopefully that will give you something to look at. But let's go on. Let's go to the next one. Joel. The book of Joel. Um, I brought some notes tonight just to, uh, I think these are just my, yeah, these are just my notes on Hosea. So if you guys want to, this, this is just my Hosea notes front and back. 
handwritten. So there's a lot of Hosea. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's not it. I'll get that later. Um, so let's look at Joel. The name Joel means Jehovah is God. And the theme of Joel we're going to find is the day of the Lord. So let's look at some things in the book of Joel. The message of the entire book of Joel is basically repent before the day of the Lord. The day is coming. You need to get right. So let's read some things here in the book of Joel. Um, let's go ahead and look at the key verse, and then we'll look at some other things. Key verse in Joel is chapter 3, verse 14. And it says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Um, this is pointing toward the point in time in the tribulation when Israel, basically God's people Israel, have to make a choice. Am I going to follow the Lord or am I going to throw him a lot with the Antichrist? And as we've been studying in Revelation, those who decide to follow the Lord um, are going to be persecuted. But the indicator is even for Jewish people, even if they take the mark of the beast, what's going to happen to them? They're still going to be persecuted. Um, so they're, they're going to be persecuted. There's going to be a time of, of difficulty coming. But God is going to save, um, save Israel. Look real quick just for a second over to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 3, verse number 20. And maybe it's Isaiah 8.20. That's the wrong verse. I can't read my writing. I may have to get, I'll have to get back on you. So let's go back to Joel. I'll have to get back to that one. Never mind. Never mind. Huh? Never mind. Um, so the theme is the day of the Lord. The, the idea is repent. So let's read a little bit. Um, Joel chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethnuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your father? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. Now, he, he's talking about an event that's happened, uh, a time of, of destruction, a time of... He's, he's referring here to a time of total destruction, that which the palmer worm hath left, the locust hath eaten. That which the locust hath left, the canker worm hath eaten. That which the canker left hath, uh, canker worm hath left, the caterpillar hath eaten. Um, basically, what what's left after all those swarms of, of bugs come through? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Um, this is a picture. This is one of the the word pictures that prophets will use to paint pictures of total destruction. Um, they were largely agricultural societies in that day. And if you had a swarm of any one of these types of bugs come through your crops, you were done. But to have palmer worm, locust, canker worm, and a caterpillar come in swarms, you were really done. I mean, you were just, there was nothing left. It was a total destruction to the point that God is trying to draw the conclu or the 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 um, draw the similarity here to get people's attention. What's coming in the future for Israel? It's going to look just like that. And again, from our study in Revelation on Sunday morning, we've seen that um, by the time Christ comes back, the nation of Israel is going to be pretty much destroyed, um, and He'll save them. So he, he goes on, he says, Awake ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because the new wine is out from your mouth. For a nation has come up on my land, strong without numbers, whose teeth are the teeth of the lion, and he hath in his cheek the great teeth of the lion. So there's a great attack coming. Um, it's going to be very vicious. He goes through this whole chapter here and um, details... How desolate the land is going to be, how broken down things are going to be. Look down to verse number 17. Um, the seed is rotten, garners are laid desolate, barns are broken down, the corn is withered. Verse 19, O Lord, to thee will I cry, for fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, the flame hath burned the trees of the field. He talks about beasts of the field crying. All these things going on are pictures of this coming day. 
Okay, now we know from more revelation, specifically in the book of Revelation, that what's probably being described here are the results of the series of judgments that we've been going through, the seal judgments, um, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. Joel didn't have that. Remember the progressive nature of Scripture, okay? Um, as we studied on Wednesday night about salvation, did Adam know as much about the gospel as we know today? Did the disciples even understand all about the gospel as much as we do today? Now, and they were there, right? And so Scripture is given progressively. God didn't give everything at one time. The prophets saw these events, but as we go through more time, we get more descriptions so we understand it a little better. Um, now, chapter 2, verse number 1. It says, the last part of verse number 1, For the day of the Lord cometh. Now he's going to describe this day. For it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness, a day of, and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning is spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong. There hath not uh, been, ever been the light, neither shall there be any more after in many generations. So there's, there's darkness, there's gloom. Notice verse 3, a fire devours before them, behind them flame burneth, the land is as the garden of Eden before them, behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, nothing shall escape them. Um, many Bible scholars believe this is a description of World War III, potentially nuclear war, um, given the description. By the time Joel prophesied, had there been great armies? Yeah. There had been the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the, the Greeks. Well, not the Greeks yet. Um, there had been many great armies. He's saying something is coming that's going to supersede all of these militaries and, and their power and everything else. Uh, notice verse number four. The appearance of them is the appearance of horsemen, and as horsemen that so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the top of mountains, they shall leap. Like the noise of flame, of fire that devours stubble as a strong people set in battle. Um, just think of the descriptions of what Joel could be describing. We know that the warfare that's described here is going to take place still in the future, right? Now, imagine if you're Joel and you're standing there in the Jezreel Valley on the top of Tel Armageddon and you're looking down the valley and prophetically, you see an F-15 go flying by and pull up over a mountaintop. How would you describe that in that day? Look at the descriptive words here. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devours stubble. You ever heard of fire? It, when I get my wood stove going, it makes a sound like... Whoosh, it starts rattling and making a noise like that. He probably never even see the wood stove. But he had probably seen the fire when farmers burn the field off at dry and the noise it makes. Um, my point is this. He's probably describing prophetically what he's seeing to us um, as taking place in some of these battles. Um, there, there are all kind of things like this. The speed they're moving, um, the appearance of them as of horsemen, and as horsemen so shall they run. Um, interesting description there. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one in his own ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust one another. Uh, they shall walk every man in his own path, and when they fall on the sword, they shall not be wounded. Uh, again, um, I, I saw a, uh, a thing on military.com the other day where they're working on a special forces uniform that's completely bulletproof. That'd be a pretty cool uniform to have if you're in that environment. Nice uh, to go downtown. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Um, so we see all these descriptions of, of intense warfare, um, a lot of people tried to apply this verse to the first Gulf War, right? When Saddam set the uh, the uh, oil fields on fire, the only problem was if you weren't in southern Iraq, you didn't see that. The sun didn't go dark here. Um, 
Verse 11, the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. His camp is very great, for he is strong. And so we see this idea um, of all of these things coming. And then notice the advice, the admonition from the prophet to the people. Verse 12, therefore now also now saith the Lord. Okay, he's given this chapter and three-quarter description of the this desolation, this warfare, these these advanced militaries. And so this is what he says. Turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garment. Isn't that interesting? We live in a day where there are a lot of law livers still that if you're not right with God, what do they tell you to do? Adjust your clothing. Don't watch bad stuff on TV. Um, what else? Don't do certain things. Don't do certain things. Hmm? Or do certain things. And, and these things aren't bad or good, but what's God looking at? The heart. He says, rend your heart, not your garments. In other words, turn. Why? Uh, turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of evil, who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave blessing behind him, even meat offering and drink. So the call from the prophet is looking at all these things that are coming. What do God's people need to do? Turn from their sin and change their heart. Um, again, a message of grace, right? Just that simple. Um, and so the book of Joel goes through Different um, different scenarios of warfare. Look in chapter three. I will all, chapter three verse two. Um, I will also gather all the nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land, and they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink, and. <coughs> And we go on and we see that all this is going on and God's going to judge these people. So um, Joel over and over and over brings up the events that are going to happen in the day of the Lord. His continual message is for God's people to turn from their sin and turn to him with all their heart. Um, so we're out of time. We'll stop there and we'll continue walking through these in the next few weeks. And again, what I'm going to try to do is just point out some of the main things. Hopefully it'll be interesting to you. To show you what God said, it will show you the heart of God is consistent in the Old Testament and the New Testament. A lot of people think, well, God just changed the way he did things in the church age. No, really, he didn't. Um, he does some things differently, but God is still God. He's still a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of grace. Um, we just have different ways to approach him now, but God is God, and we see that clearly in prophecy. So, um any questions over Hosea, Joel, or the introduction to the Minor Prophets? Yes, ma'am. Well, I was just thinking about um, the verse that you studied out in Sunday School, Revelation um, 16, um, verse 9, when even at that point, um, they mm. still did not repent. And that kind of reminded me of that Joel chapter 2 yeah. situation. If you're not familiar with that, in Revelation 16, it's in the middle of... Um, the fresh water turning to blood. And basically it says in the middle of one of the verses that God is a God who does that, and yet the people still don't repent. The implication being, had they got their heart right, God could have called it off. But instead they hardened their heart, they basically shook their fist in God's face, and again we see that these things happen over and over. So um, learn from the mistakes of Israel. Anything else? All right, take a break.